Ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to hear, continue on as this topic is class. Uh, and uh, the different approaches and viewpoints of how we do this class was like to New York. And uh, we have some uh, very qualified people here to talk to you. Sally, who is our, uh, is the, the, uh, the manager of the Division of uh, Materials Management at uh, New York State DC, who's been kind enough to come all the way down from Albany. Uh, we have uh, Andrew Layden from uh, the great county of Onondaga and the Onondaga uh, Resource Recovery Agency to talk about the bottle bill. Uh, Paul Gilman of Covanta. Uh, is another very distinguished speaker that is the Environmental Compliance Director for the Covanta uh, uh, Energy. Uh, and he's familiar with all of the plants that Covanta operates in, their, how they manage on plants. And I think this Paul will be a very good idea. So I'd like to thank everybody for all of our speakers for coming. And uh, I will turn it over to Dave for the DEC perspective on glass recycling. Nathan, do I? So let's see. All right, how's that? No? Yes? Nope? Hear me in the back? Hear me at all? Hear me in the front? Hear me on the side? No? Yeah. All right. Yikes. Okay. Well, I'll talk loud. If it's too loud, let me know. Um, as Kerry uh, uh, Gallagher had uh, mentioned at the beginning, that um, I would talk a, a little bit about some of uh, uh, the, the state's, I guess, position or the, our characterization of the law um, that kind of set recycling going and how it all fits in, and that kind of plays into some of the uh, issues and struggles that... Um, uh, some of the municipalities are dealing with with glass. Um, it might not be the uh, the most popular um, uh, discussion point with towns, but uh, but that's uh, that's my job here. So um, from the uh, state perspective, uh, it's men been mentioned a couple times uh, by a few of the speakers about um, how it all got started. Recycling uh, law uh, passed the Solid Waste Management Act in 19 of 1988. Um, included the requirements for uh, source separation. Um, how it worked was the law passed that said that um, state said every municipality must adopt a local law or ordinance that requires source separation of components of the solid waste uh, stream for uh, reuse and recycling by September 1st, 1992. So if you had set your stuff out for uh, for collection or if you were dropping it off at a solid waste management facility. So that was the base piece. Um, it had defined um, the, uh, so anything for which an economic market exists. Those were the, uh, the key words in there. So components were, um, were listed as paper, glass, metal, plastics, yard and yard waste, and other um, materials that can be separated from the waste <coughs> So. There was another piece about economic markets, and it defined what economic markets were. And economic markets is anything that is, if the um, uh, full, proper collection, dis uh, transportation, uh, and disposal costs uh, were greater than the cost to collect and uh, recover materials, minus any uh, sale or, or value you might have. So essentially, it said the rules in place that said the base marker for how you decide whether you have to source separate a material is based on if it's less, it costs less than or equal to the cost to dispose. And it's supposed to be the full cost, so it has all the different pieces in it, um, the full uh, part, soup to nuts. So we're setting forth the plan that said, okay, as of this time, you have to have recycling, source separation and recycling in place. So it, it set that date as September 1st, 92. So with that, um, the whole deal about um, if it's uh, set for collection, set out for collection, you have to have it. If it's uh, if you um, are dropping it off or if you um, are delivering um, the waste to a facility, the reason that stuff is in there is because waste is handled very differently across the state. Uh, down here, the vast majority is picked up. 
um, at the curb, uh, garbage service was always here. You get to go put back in time in 1988 when they were writing it. Well, what are they thinking? They're saying, okay, if there's a waste collection system that is picks up at your home, then you're going to have to put in some kind of source separation system to mirror that so you have that same level of service. If it is a drop-off, which much of the state, actually uh, large areas of the state, that's how waste is managed. There's a drop-off for waste. There's a transfer facility. And so what the concept was and why it was written in is if you deliver, the concept was if you go to that drop-off facility, you should have an alternative there for the recyclables. Um, so that's how it set, it, uh, set us off. Um, so in about 92, when all the laws had to be in place, Part of our role as uh, the department or our responsibilities, we have some regulatory uh, responsibilities related to planning and, and so forth. And so there are requirements that planning units or um, to, to move forward had to have be consistent with state law. That makes sense. Um, so part of what we have to do is review and make sure that programs are consistent with the law, 120AA. And so that started us off on the recycling uh, this recycling road. There were grant funds and all sorts of programs that came along with that. And so there's a 50% reimbursement for, to help um, for uh, capital costs, for equipment, trucks, bins, um, equipment to process, all that came in place. By 2000, uh, year 2000, grant funds became available for education and outreach for, um, for waste reduction and recycling as well. Again, 50%, that's how the law is set up, caps it at 50% reimbursement by the state with a cap of $2 million per project. So <coughs> those kinds of things um, laid the groundwork and said, okay, we're going to require this, and we're going to create these funding programs, and we're going to create some uh, regulatory programs, and we're going to create some uh, technical assistance programs. So that was another piece that we have a responsibility to do, and we did. So in 1992, um, Carrie had mentioned, uh, quoted the number 9206, so it's a Technical Administrative Guidance Memorandum, TAGM. So we wrote it back then that to help, uh, it had two, two basic purposes. One, it was at the beginning of programs, so people, uh, municipalities had to figure out, well, what materials am I supposed to put in? What is an economic market? So we tried to help by identifying, these are the steps that you have to go through when you're identifying if there's an economic market for material to add into the program. Because again, we're back in time when it's first started. But when that guidance was written, we also wrote in pieces that recognizing markets go up and down and everybody's going to have to deal with that potentially at some point. The things you need to consider and look at when, you, when and if you got in a circumstance where you wanted to uh, remove something from a system, when the un economic market no longer existed. So it set a, a process up in that that, um, that mirrors the concept of a right, uh, you're going to have a recycling program. That's what the law sets up. It's setting up mirror kinds of programs for your systems in, in, a, in a basic sort of sense. So if you had curbside, you're going to have curb collection for garbage. You're going to have curbside collection for waste reduction or for uh, recycling. If you were dropping off, you have a drop off system. And try to evaluate or lay out all the things that are supposed to be evaluated when you're making those decisions. Again, all focused on that comparison to your actual full disposal cost. So lots of the, uh, so that's the basis behind everything. So now when you get it and you apply it to some of the circumstances today, and we've been doing this for the, since 92, so over 25 years, that's the rule, that's the things in place, words haven't changed, we've changed the name of some divisions a few times here or there, but um, that's been the, the, the process that we've run under for 25 years. So now we're into a circumstance and some struggles with glass. And so when, um, when uh, some of the, you heard some of the towns and some of the struggles that they had. And they go so from single stream to, um, well, we're going to drop back to dual stream. And we're going to go dual stream, but not glass. Um, OK, the dual stream was supposed to drop it because the glass was uh, uh, affecting the paper. But now we're taking it out of that before we implemented it. Those are things that concern us. We look at it. We know and we have received the, the, some of the copies of some of the bids that, um, that the towns have received. Now, sometimes they're short-term bids because they was in the middle of a budget year and some of those struggles. And so we recognize it's a real bad time. It came up really quickly. But 
with the basis of the law and our guidance documents, the uh, message that we conveyed to the towns and have to convey um, was that it's supposed to be based off economic markets, the full amount, not that your costs might have gone up, but how are they comparing to that full disposal? So that's what we, we put the towns on notice, that you are going to have to come in with an economic market analysis at some point here if you're going to continue not including materials like a glass um, to show that all of the full avoided costs or all the costs were considered when you're making that calculation. It's guided by law, it's guided by our rules, and um, so that's what we did. Now we understand that when it comes in the middle of a budget cycle, that that long-term view sometimes is not something you have the luxury of dealing with and say, okay, yeah, maybe I could ride this out for a year or two years, or I have to prepare this analysis to show these costs, or maybe my cost today dropped from $100 a ton I was getting for paper down to three, and I have to absorb this cost somehow, and this is one way I'm going to do it, and I have to, I have to function. So we get that. And so we have tried very hard as a department on a broad scale um, uh, one gentleman mentioned something about getting an NOV for storage, so I'd like to hear a little bit more about that because that's uh, not something that we, uh, we were trying to pursue at all. We went the opposite direction. We have requirements in our regulations for residue uh, rates in order to get permits. We put out an enforcement discretion memo that said we're going to waive those, understanding there's market struggles and we didn't want somebody to be in a bind for storage. We um, issued their storage requirements for your for facilities and we put on enforcement discretion that said we can extend those if you just let us know. We also put in a piece about extending the opportunity to store in, in <coughs> places other than just the facility itself, another piece of property by the town. So we did an awful lot of things from the storage side. And so what we've been doing on this other side with this economic market evaluation thing we get it, we understand it's a bad time, but we want people to think back to whatever the law established as far as economic markets compared to disposal, full disposal costs. That's how it's supposed to be measured, not the instant uh, budgetary cycle that uh, someone's on. Um, so we put that notice out, we understand we, uh, there's experimentation is how we're doing it um, with drop off and we're very anxious to see the percentage um, of participation in those kinds of programs. That may make a huge uh, difference when people calculate. Um, we understand that um, there could, other be, could be other types of collection schemes that could be and should be evaluated certainly as part of that economic analysis. Um, some of it is go back to dual stream, so they went to um, still keeping it one collection per per week, but alternated materials. Well, maybe there needs to be an evaluation of glass. One uh, dropped Oyster Bay, I guess it was. No, not Oyster Bay. Somebody dropped, and so, yeah, it was Oyster Bay. It's gonna be, we'll keep all these materials, but we're dropping the glass. Well, maybe that should be the alternate week. Maybe it's just the glass should have one collection alone, and the other materials, if, the, if it's not contaminating the paper. If it, plastics are contaminating the paper, maybe it can be the glass and the plastics. And so those kinds of things have to be evaluated when you go through that economic evaluation eventually. And so we're looking at it as everybody's learning, everybody's growing, everybody's trying to get through this period. And we want to help with that. We don't want to squash anybody, but we do have to, we have a responsibility to remind everybody those are similar to the requirements in the law. Some of those full avoided costs that we, we lay out in, um, in those uh, guidance documents sometimes are things that you might forget as you move along. Um, I did hear, uh, actually Anthony had mentioned something about uh, glass going to ash, and uh, so that's one of those costs that you also, uh, as an example of one of those full uh, analysis of cost. Um, so for instance, uh, the glass, you say we're, we're going to collect the drop off, even if that complied with the, uh, the interpretation of the law, we'll set that concept off for the side, but let's say you looked at it. The participation in glass drops, so now more glass is in the disposal stream. So that now that glass rides along and is disposed of, so you pay that tipping fee. 
It also you have the transportation cost for that. It also goes to a combustor, which just goes through the combustor and goes into the ash. Then that ash is now a greater cost because you have more of it that comes back out to go to the landfill. So you have that transportation cost to go back in the landfill as ash. And then in Long Island, we have a, another significant concern and cost to look at related to that increased ash. Uh, the town of Brookhaven landfill is where the ash goes. Uh, it's limited and the capacity is limited and it's shrinking. So part of the, um, the uh, solid waste uh, council that uh, Terry, uh, Terry had talked about was there was an ash um, subcommittee. And some of the concerns are, we're gonna be in trouble here in Long Island unless we construct new ash capacity on island or the costs are gonna go up to get it off island, rail, truck, all those other things. So that's this, on the verge of an ash crisis. So with all of this, there's a cost, a depletion cost that you're applying there. You're taking a precious commodity away of airspace in that ash by just moving the glass across island and back to island. So those are some of those, those hidden kinds of costs that you that might not think about that are tried to be laid out in that, uh, that economic analysis. So those are the kinds of things um, that the, the state's looking uh, at in the longer term to try to get everybody back on track. Hopefully markets can move. Maybe we can develop some markets here. The, um, the state, we did have this, uh, actually Anthony had talked about it. We had a glass form down here. The Department of Transportation talked about their uh, guidelines and their opportunities in their specifications for materials. But as Anthony had pointed out, it says may so they can offer up to you can use up to 30 percent glass in uh in their uh, base and binder courses in road construction and their uh embankment but nobody's doing it so that's why he suggested if you said must unless it's available that might be a place to change and try to drive it of course that might displace other materials which are stacking up which we heard like asphalt and other materials we have to move to so there are some other consequences that may have to look we look at, but that's some of what we're looking at in the new state solid waste management plan. Things we're evaluating. How can we make a difference there? We also have uh, uh, Pollution Prevention Institute um, is doing some research for us about glass and trying to touch into some of the markets. Um, and they are working potentially with uh, SUNY Alfred, who has a glass science program, to see um, where can we go, and so the state can work in ways to help that. We're also trying in the marketing side. Um, Carrie had mentioned the, the meeting we're trying to uh, establish with any planning is that are interested. We had worked with uh, to get some information from Pace Glass about uh, about opportunities for them to come out. And so Legion is working on setting up uh, something with any municipalities that are interested in doing that. They gave us a price. They, we said, can you come out and help Long Island? And they gave us a price. They said, we, we, we'll take it for zero. Um, so that could help, so we're trying to foster those relationships. So those are the kinds of things we're doing in the short term, understanding we have this bigger, broader, long-term responsibility over us as well um, with the law and our guidance. So that's all I got. I told you it was not gonna be a, a thrilling or popular or uh, just remotely entertaining co construction. But, but that's all I got for you. I'm not Anthony Corr, I'll tell you that. <laughs> very proud of that. 
and, and get time in this town. And, and coming down here today, I had about a 300 mile drive from, from Syracuse. I learned something very, very important. That if you're coming through like you know, that upstate through Pennsylvania, New Jersey, you gotta find a place to go to the bathroom before you get to the GW. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I have learned a lot. Really. <laughs> Uh, and actually, the first thing I was going to do, can you guys hear me okay, Bonnie, can you hear me? Yes. The first thing I was going to do here was going to, I was going to thank Eric Swenson for inviting me, but that was before, as of 5, 5.30 yesterday afternoon, for the first time in my life, I had experienced something called the Long Island Expressway. <laughs> <laughs> and now, I don't want to thank express. <laughs> I'm going to kill Eric. <laughs> Something like that. So while I'm sitting in traffic, um, uh, you know, my, my mind is wandering, and I'm thinking literally 40 years back. Is there any, um, are there any Boston University Terriers in the room by any chance? Any BU Terriers? Um, so, first really, I guess is the only one <laughs> But coincidentally, 40 years ago, I know you're all thinking, geez, he doesn't look that old. 40 years ago, um, as part of a public speaking class, uh, I actually gave, I had to give a persuasive speech. Maybe some of you have gone through this exercise. And it, it was about opposing, at that time, the Massachusetts uh, proposed bottle bill, around 1980 plus or minus. And I was conflicted then. I mean, I, I, you know, the speech was in, in opposition to, to, to establishing the Massachusetts bottle bill. And I was conflicted then. And, but, but seriously, folks, I am just as conflicted today uh, about opposing uh, the bottle bill. Because as you'll see in a second, and I think as George has already provided us with some statistics, is that nickel is a very, very powerful economic incentive to recover that material and reduce trash and increase recycling. So additions, I think, exist that we need to kind of look at the whole picture in terms of the impact on our system, and I'll get to that real quick. Uh, but uh, before we go uh, any further, and I do promise him plus words to be kind of quick about what I have. I only have like eight slides or so, and I go through it pretty quickly. Um, I, I also serve as the chair of the New York Product Stewardship Council. And we do have a few members uh, of that, that, that board here in the room today, so I just want to recognize Jim Bunchuk, um, Tom Salvo, uh, Ken Armelino from Covanta, mm -hmm. and uh, oh, we have one other person in the room that's also Oh yeah, Eric Swenson <laughs> uh, is also on the, the, the Product Stewardship Council. So Eric, thank you. Um, Yeah, I hope everybody can see this. But as, as Mary said, that, that nickel is a really, really powerful economic incentive. And George, don't get excited here. I don't disagree with you. Is that the 35% is really too high. It's really, I was really too generous here. And, and you know, we were talking about the statistics before. The numbers for some of these things can be all over the place. But certainly at least twice as high for the recovery of these materials if they have that five cent deposit um, uh, versus uh, you know, just recovery through the, the curbside container system. So yeah, at best, I'm thinking 20% there, you know, for recovery rate without the five cent deposit. And that's why I'm conflicted about this folks, okay? Because we, we, we do know the power of that nickel. Speaking of the nickels, they really, really do add up. Uh, and as Will had said previously, it's over $100 million a year, 2017. It was 114 million in unclaimed deposits, 114 million in unclaimed deposits that the state uh, received in, in terms of revenue. And as we probably all know, it's 80% of the, of, the, of the total unclaimed deposits go back to the state. Um, and as, as David Tal reminded me this morning, only $23 million, up to $23 million, can be directed towards the Environmental Protection Fund to support some of our environmental projects, our our, our personnel, our, our educational outreach. The rest of it goes into something that we all know uh, as the general fund. So I think one policy going forward is that the state could take would be to put, uh, is to increase that cap and put more of the unclaimed deposits into the um, environmental protection fund. Um, so with, with the expansion of the bottle bill, what we're looking at is really kind of a double whammy. Because in the wake of the, uh, the national sword, collectively, outside of New York City, we're already looking at a 40 to $50 million statewide impact of, of increased net increased recycling costs. Uh, and uh, that is, is, is just compounded by the, the loss, the potential loss of value if the bottle bill 
is, is uh, implemented as proposed. So we're looking at statewide as a, up to a $60 million hit to local municipalities between the, the, the China store and the potential loss in the value. You may be wondering, why does that exclude New York City? Anybody have an idea why it might exclude New York City? Tourism. What is it? Tourism. It's not tourism. It's uh, it's something called Pratt Industry. So as as uh, Tom and all this, he's got a contract for the movement called his mixed paper. So it's to a great extent uh, protecting the folks in New York City. Okay. But uh, that that it, 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 that we're looking for it, the, 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 some reimbursement from the state uh, in the wake of the of, of this environmental uh, of the economic impact due to both the China sword and the bottle well, As I said, statewide about a $60 million uh, total impact. So just to be, you know, focusing on glass for a second, big, big picture, and these are mostly kind of <coughs> estimates, but if anybody wants to you know, uh, you know, ask questions or to frankly challenge some of my statistics, um, I'm happy to you know, discuss my, my kind of uh, uh, process of uh, coming up with some of these But there's, uh, I, we're not a MRF operator down in Nevada County, but there's probably others in the room who can give you a sense of how, how close I am. But other total incoming, Residential street, we're not talking about commercial, we're not talking about the resident, red, uh, the restaurants, uh, just in terms of what residents put out their curbside, about 17% of that incoming material uh, it, it is glass. Uh, so statewide, that's roughly 270,000 tons of, of material, residential glass only. And if you want to estimate, I think, what that means for your community, per capita, per year, it's about 28 pounds per person. You want to figure out how much residential glass, somewhere in that, in that neighborhood. And again, by my very, very rough estimates, of that incoming glass, 40% of it by weight is wine. He likes our wine. We also like our Tito's, because 20% of it is, is spirits, okay? Is, is, is alcohol by weight. And then 10% um, non-alcoholic beverages. So all in, about 190,000 tons a year of beverage container glass. The other 80,000 tons, obviously, is a food glass spaghetti sauce, salsa jars, things of that nature. So just like I said, kind of big picture of what we're dealing with statewide in terms of COVID labs. And all I've tried to do here is give you a rough estimate of how much more additional revenue might be received by the state if uh, the bottle bill is uh, expanded to include wine and spirits. So the bottom line there, as they say, is about $11 million in total additional uh, revenue to the state from the unclaimed deposits on wine and glass. Okay, so about 790,000, uh, 790 million individual total number of glass beverage containers. That's a, an estimate from the uh, Container Recycling Institute. Um, you know, as, as we saw earlier, about 35 percent are unclaimed containers. 65% uh, do get reclaimed. So that gives us about 276 million containers and five cent deposit, a uh, total of uh, almost 14 million. 80% of that goes to the state, so that's how we come up with the 11 million. Kind of make sense there? And uh, this is a, a, the results of a survey that we're taking in 2017 uh, of about, I think it's 250 or 300, uh, of both public sector and private sector MRF operators. And the expectation that they found in terms of their residents was that the, the great support and expectation that there's going to be on the part of the resident that that glass that they're putting in there is going to be recycled. Uh, and it, it's interesting to note that only 65% uh, of the respondents, again, these are MRF operators, had concerns with glass recycling. That was 2017. What do you think that level, that percentage might be today? You know, probably closer to 100%, right? Uh, so as, as we were the collective we were, were considering proposing a limited expansion of the bottle bill to include glass only. Uh, I think there are many of us who felt, well, let's make sure that there's a market for that material. And what I've learned and what I've consistently heard is there is market demand for clean glass. So there's a solution. We've mentioned it several times. It's the bottle bill. There is a market solution. The problem is a, is a, a public policy it's a political problem. It's convincing the New York State Legislature to implement this. And it's great that we are doing a great job talking amongst ourselves. Now we've got to take this energy and communicate to our elected officials in New York State. And I distributed before my little chat today uh, two, two documents. And one is an action alert. 
So if you want this to happen, you need to help be part of the effort to reach out to your local elected officials in Albany and let them know that you feel strongly about expanding the bottle bill, particularly for glass. So there's a market for this stuff, but not so much this stuff. You folks know what this is, right? It's Merc glass. So the question is, you know, really, uh, one of the questions is, where are the glass manufacturers in this? Where's their leadership? And so far, it's non-existent, right? We're going to talk about that in just a second. Uh, so uh, the state solid waste and recycling associations have, have joined forces, and we are reaching out to the state legislature, our elected officials, and requesting that they provide, as part of the budget, 40 to $50 million in direct financial support to local municipalities, 40 to $50 million. Again, that's from that estimate in the wake of the national sword, uh, the, the market impact. And currently, not one cent of EPF funds are eligible to help us with these, these market impact costs, okay? And our other proposal to the state legislature is to expand the bottle bill on a limited basis for glass <coughs> only. But if they're going to expand it uh, to reimburse local municipal recycling programs, uh, they, if they're going to expand, if expand it as proposed by the governor, then they should uh, it, it, uh, provide the local municipal recycling programs with, with financial support and the loss in value. So just real quickly, I'm just going to run through the, the, the bottle bill proposals, both the governor's proposal, this is only going to take a second, both the governor's proposal and, and, and the proposal that Assemblyman Engelbright referenced uh, as part of her, his remarks uh, earlier this afternoon. So the governor is proposing all carbonated and non-carbonated drinks in liquid form be added to the bottle bill, excluding wine and alcohol. And he's not proposing any change to the processing fee paid by distributors to retail collectors uh, and redemption centers, which is currently uh, 3.5 cents per container. That's that sound about right, Dave? Uh, and then the assemblyman this afternoon, uh, he mentioned that he had proposed his own bill. And just, you might want to make a note of this. It's Assembly Bill 505028A. Assembly Bill 5028A. So this proposal in includes wine and liquor and hard cider, also coffee and tea and sports drinks. It excludes, it excludes 100% uh, uh, fruit beverages. So I, things like, I, I would assume, jugs of cider, which comes in what? HDPE too, right? Uh, it, also, the assemblyman's proposal would increase the processing fee to five cents uh, per container, which is paid from the, the bottle distributors to the bottle redemption operations. Just understand that that's separate and apart from the five cent deposit. These are really two separate systems that are going on. Uh, one other thing, though, that's kind of interesting about the assemblyman's proposal, it's mandating uh, within several years that uh, containers uh, would have to have a certain minimum percentage of recycled content. So for glass and aluminum, minimum 35% recycled content. For PET, 30% minimum recycled content. That's not right away, but that's a few years down the line. And then just real quickly, what's the political status of this? And the assemblyman kind of referenced this earlier uh, as well, is that the one house budget bills in the Senate and the assembly side have rolled back the proposal their own proposals for expanding the bottle bill. It's no longer in the Senate or the, the Assembly's one house budget bill. So when some of us went to Albany a few weeks ago, both the private sector folks and the public sector folks the next day, I think we lit some fires and we really put the brakes on that in short order. Let that be, I think, a lesson to all of us is the power that we have in Albany when we work together and voice our concerns. Um, so that said though, it's, it's only a little bit dead. It's not dead and it's not even most dead. It's only a little bit dead because there is a significant state budget gap. And from what we're hearing is that the governor is still, I think, uh, working hard uh, to include the bottle bill in the final uh, budget that's you know, uh, aimed for passage on April 1. Okay, so that's why the folks in Albany need to hear from us. Just a couple more things real quick. So what's the path forward here, the bigger picture? Um, and, and we've all been talking about it today. The path forward is greater private sector involvement in, in recycling uh, and for the supply chain. 
Because right now there's this disconnect. The, the producers have no incentive to, uh, whether it's packaging other products, to, to, to design for recyclability. So what would product stewardship do? What would EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, do? And those are basically very, very similar terms. EPR is what product stewardship is mandated by law, okay? So product stewardship, kind of like the, the general overall term for requiring manufacturer responsibility at the end of a product or package of life. But when it's mandated, it's called EPR. So this would provide non-taxpayer funding to sustainability uh, uh, and support recovery and recycling. So in terms of the tax cap, I mean, we would be able to use all those funds for all the other public needs that we have. We would pay for this, again, as although the producers be responsible, we would be paying essentially as consumers and not as taxpayers anymore for the recovery and the recycling of these products. So it shifts end of life responsibility for products and packaging from the government to the producer. Currently, the producers, they have no skin in this game. It's like your, your kid. You want the kid to clean his room, right? And what do you keep on cleaning the room for? Do you think they're ever going to clean their own room? This is kind of what's going on with us now, in a sense. We're, we're cleaning the producers, the manufacturers' rooms in terms of the end-of-life management of their unwanted products and packaging. In fact, recently in Connecticut, when uh, there was a, a session to explore uh, product stewardship, uh, a representative of the industry from the, uh, the Grocery Manufacturers Association testified to the Connecticut legislature about the issue of product stewardship recovery of these materials, they said, their testimony was, quote, that's what taxes are for. Think about that. I don't know, just one more thought here. Um, you know, many of us often get calls uh, from residents. Why don't you recycle this? Why don't we, you know, why don't you recycle that, right? We had no input <coughs> in that, that material being put into the marketplace. Zero input, right? But now somehow it's our responsibility to fix that, recover it, and find some way to pay for it and get it recycled. We would not be the first ones in the pool here, folks, if we were to explore the potential benefits of product stewardship for New York State. There's already four Northeast states that are already currently exploring this, Vermont, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Maine. We should all be working together, I think, to create uh, a Northeast coalition to explore product stewardship. If I had come to you a couple years ago, 2017 for sure, with this kind of information, uh, I think you think, oh, that's interesting, but Andrew, you're ahead of your time. Folks, it's time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see here. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about how Covanta fits in on the island, uh, a little bit about what we've been doing recently in recycling metals. And then lastly, I'm going to address Dave's concern about the ash crisis that's, that's pending. Um, so let me see if I can manage this. So this is, I'll go over this just briefly. Uh, uh, we operate uh, over 40 facilities in North America and increasingly in, the, uh, in, the, in Ireland and in the UK. Uh, we uh, process a little over 20 million tons a year across the, the country. Um, and we do a considerable amount of metals recycling in the process of doing that. That's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. Um, I can say to you today, we're processing about 600,000 tons a year in metals, both ferrous and non-ferrous. Um, six, eight years ago, I would have said that's about 400,000 tons a year. Now, we haven't increased, really, the capacity of the company to process waste, but that's the increased capacity we've put in place to recycle metals. Um, on the island, uh, 
uh, we operate four facilities. Those four facilities uh, recycle over uh, 55,000 tons of ferrous metals uh, per year. Um, we also uh, process uh, about 4,300 tons of non-ferrous. Um, we like to kind of put those things into some perspective. Uh, we usually talk nationally about Golden Gate bridges. I thought we'd talk about Throg's Neck bridges. Um, so we, we process enough metal each year to build a Throg's Neck bridge on the, uh, on the ferrous side. On the non-ferrous side, the equivalent of about 290 million soda cans a year. So communities obviously have a choice with their post-recycled waste. They can landfill it or they can send it to energy recovery. If it goes to landfilling, you lose a Throg's Neck bridge a year and uh, you lose 290 million soda cans a year. Um, interestingly, the recycled metal, if you think about the energy that goes into uh, processing that metal from scratch, not recycled, but virgin metal, uh, we're saving the equivalent of, uh, of enough energy to, to power 19,000 homes a year. So we process 1.8 million tons of the island's waste. Um, about a million tons goes off island. This is where it goes, upstate New York, Ohio, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Um, if that wasn't going off island, we'd save about 40,000 long haul truck trips a year, 2 million gallons of diesel fuel, and uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the equivalent of about 21 million pounds of coal. I wanted to throw this slide in here because there's a part of our story uh, in making electricity with this waste uh, that I'm not sure folks fully appreciate. Um, these are data from uh, the National Renewable uh, Energy Laboratory looking at the carbon footprint associated with generating a megawatt hour of electricity for the various different ways of making electricity. Coal to the positive, uh, roughly about a ton CO2 equivalent for every uh, megawatt hour produced. Natural gas, about half of that. I think you all know that people think of natural gas as much more efficient, lower CO2. Nuclear, wind, and solar, all slightly positive. Why is that? This is done on a life cycle basis. It's looking at the capital infrastructure, the fuel, uh, transportation, and the like. And so while a nuclear plant doesn't generate uh, uh, CO2 in its operation, the steel, the cement that goes into it, certainly considerable amount of energy expended in generating that. The one way of making electricity that actually has a negative greenhouse gas impact is using your municipal solid waste from your homes to generate electricity. And why is that? That's because largely it's the avoided methane from the landfill when the waste is put in the landfill. Methane's a very potent greenhouse gas. It creates the greenhouse gas effect much more strongly than just CO2. And so in avoiding that methane generation, you're making a very significant contribution to greenhouse gas reduction. And the EPA has a rule of thumb for every ton of municipal solid waste you process, you're avoiding about a ton of greenhouse gases. So, you know, something for the island to be kind of proud of. The recycling is saving significantly on greenhouse gases and using that, that waste as a, as a fuel for electricity production and uh, avoiding its, its rotting in a landfill is a good thing. So a little bit of discussion here about the journey we've been making to try and be more sustainable as a company and for our communities. Uh, trying to do more in terms of that metal recovery. I told you about you know, the, the fairly significant improvement we've made. Uh, in 2016, we started to significantly, 2015 and 16, our attention to the question of uh, not just metal recovery, but ash recovery. Um, and uh, we've been working with 
uh, industry, asphalt, cement. Uh, we've been working with uh, uh, universities to better understand uh, how that material could be used. Um, and we're in the process this year of permitting a facility uh, that will be located in Pennsylvania to be our first look at recycling of ash. The design capacity would be about a 65% recycling rate on the ash process. It would increase our metal recovery, it would create aggregate, it would create sand. Um, and uh, our, our hope is to have that up and running in the third quarter of this year. Um, it'll it'll uh, take ash from our facilities in New Jersey um, and uh, it's, it's uh, we are very hopeful that it will prove out to be uh, uh, the kind of thing that if we can find a way to do it here on the island, uh, it would make a substantial contribution to dealing with that pending ash crisis. Uh, this is a little bit more on the components of, of the ash as we see it. There's more ferrous and non-ferrous metal uh, to be garnered. Uh, there is uh, a residue that that 35 percent that we still will be landfilling, but the production of, of aggregate, low-grade uh, iron uh, material, uh, and further metal concentrate uh, other than iron and, and uh, um, non-ferrous is quite substantial. Um, and this is a picture of the facility that we have in, in uh, Fairless, Pennsylvania. It's actually, uh, we currently are processing our, both our ferrous and our non-ferrous from our various facilities around the country to upgrade the material, to make it more marketable. Um, and uh, the facility that, that we're building in between the two will be our, what we call our total ash processing or recycling facility. That was all I had to say for today. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yes, a long time in the environmental business, solid waste business, and uh, still, in, still uh, enjoying it and uh, hopefully coming up with everybody in this room with more solutions. So um, I don't really have any uh, prepared uh, full-on remarks. Uh, to be honest, I ceded my time to Anthony Kaur earlier in the program. <laughs> After my years of experience of working with Anthony, I knew how that was going to go. Uh, and thank you, Anthony, did a great job. Uh, but I think, uh, so, on the uh, agendas listed some you know counterpoints and I guess I have a couple of counterpoints but I also want to make some further points on, on some of the information that was provided um, and so uh, the, the, the first I guess counterpoint might be um, and I say this with great respect because I have great respect for Covanta and Covanta has done and actually is a key part of the solid waste management program on Long Island uh, but most of the presentation was about this you know 2019 ash processing where I think 20 years ago Frank Rothell uh, has been in this sort of uh, spirit of, of building the ash blocks uh, so either 30 years ago 30 years ago so either Frank was a genius or he held from ancient aliens so I, I guess that's one point that I would have to make that it's taken quite a long time to get to that point and I think right now clearly that energy has to be stepped up because if that Brookhaven landfill close, closes, we all know there's going to be a problem with uh, ash. Uh, anyway, that was one point I want to make, and maybe we can talk a little bit about that in the further discussion as we get along. And I also did want to hear a little bit more about just the glass issue. You know, we understand that uh, if glass doesn't uh, get recycled in containers, or if it doesn't get extended in the bottle bill, more glass is going to wind up in the MSW, more glasses come to you. So I think that would be another point that would be important to make. Um, 
And uh, with respect to my good friend uh, Dave, uh, you know, Dave has a really tough job. And I think, as I've said a number of times at any number of uh, public events and in my class that I teach, our uh, Department of Environmental Conservation has a very, very difficult job. It's a job that is planning responsibility, management responsibility, and enforcement responsibility. And I think the comments Dave made, I think uh, very, very well made, expresses that sort of difficulty. So now we're in this kind of this really a crisis situation where we almost had the collapse of recycling <laughs> in total on Long Island. Fortunately, between industry and, and municipalities, there was a lot of quick thinking. There was a lot of cooperation to keep a system running. And, and the descriptions during the municipal segment of how those bids had to go and how fast they had to go. Uh, so as with respect to the, the glass issue, um, I think I might actually disagree with Dave's interpretation of 120AA, um, although uh, you know, I understand that uh, uh, it is a potential recyclable product. But I think as Brookhaven has done, as a, in a, no, a, number, a, a number of the municipalities are looking at, is if you don't put them out at the curbside, okay, and you bring them or you allow a public drop-off drop center, I don't think that's inconsistent with 120AA at all. Because if we, when you read that uh, statute, it basically says solid waste which has been left for collection or which is delivered by the generator of such waste to a solid waste management facility. So yeah, I think if it's left for collection, I think the argument is it's got to be sort of separated from the trash into recyclables. But if it's brought to a, uh, a uh, a drop-off center, I think that, that uh, might be uh, uh, really uh, consistent with that law. But the point I wanted to make with respect to Dave's comments is this is a really difficult job. And I think if you look at the history, and Dave's been involved with this history of the state solid waste management planning efforts, of the planning units on Long Island having very difficult issues over the years in terms of uh, coming up with the right plans. And this whole issue that, uh, as was mentioned, in terms of planning responsibility, and Dave made a point, there's required recycling analysis in every solid waste management plan. And anybody who uh, runs a facility or has a permit for a solid waste management uh, facility, your permit says that you can't take material unless it's from a municipality that has an approved uh, comprehensive recycling analysis. So uh, that, I said, I think goes to my point earlier, that that makes that job really difficult for the Department of Environmental Conservation to be all of those pieces put, put together. So I have great respect for uh, the work that's being done. I do want to talk about the bottle bill. And here, I, uh, I think I really pretty much agree with uh, just about everything that Andrew was saying. And I've been involved in some of those conversations with the legislators in Albany and listening to what's going on in Albany. And I wanted to make a couple of points. So uh, as was pointed out by Andrew, so you have the governor's bottle bill who basically says, well, we're going to put more plastics, right? And everybody's saying, wait a second, industry's saying, and municipalities are saying, that's going to cost us money. That's the 40 or $15 million. Is that the number, Andrew? Uh, 10 million. For the 10 million? Okay. okay. And at least, 10 million. at least 10 million. So we hear not only from industry, because I was part of that, and we hear from municipalities, and I think the uh, Associ State Association of Counties has taken a formal position that that really is going to hurt the revenues that uh, uh, municipalities uh, receive from those programs. The alternative bill, as was talked about, uh, the assembly bill, and uh, Assem Assemblyman Engelbright has moved that out of his committee, basically says, OK, uh, same proposal on the plastics that the governor's bill has, pretty much, a little bit less, I think. Uh, but it adds the wines and spirits, right? So that was one of the big issues that we said when we went to Albany, you know, why are you putting more plastic in the bottle bill? If anything, put the wine and spirit bottles and the glass in the bottle bill. That makes good sense, right? Because we all know, as was described a couple of times here in some really good presentations earlier, the, the glass, if it's separated by color and it's whole glass in those redemption centers, and I, um, if you're really interested in this, you can see the EW glass uh, facility in, uh, in the city. Uh, they're taking that glass, and it's getting recycled into new glass. Where we all saw, as the picture they Andrew presented, the glass from the, 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 the Mercs is not. By the way, one of the things we also counted with uh, in Albany with respect to the bottle bill was, hey, 
In fact, why don't you put the alum take the aluminum off the bottle bill and put that back in the curbside program? Because if you did that, that would, and, and don't take more of those plastics out, you then provide, you keep the revenue that you have from the plastics you're looking to take out, Governor Cuomo, and you put aluminum back in that program that could really uh, do, uh, I think, a really good job in funding some of the programs that need to be continued and even probably some of, some of the infrastructure. Uh, so I wanted to mention a couple of those comments. Final comment with respect to the bottle bill. If you look at even the Assemblyman Engelweit's bill, okay, because it's based on the theory, and it's, I think, probably statistically true, their theory is the bottle bill is the best recycling mechanism in the state of New York. That's the best way to recycle those containers. I don't know if that's totally true, but that's the premise that the, that the people in Albany are going by. That's why it's, okay, we'll add more, add more, add more. I think the other part that needs to be mentioned for the consideration, and this is sort of the counterpoint to where the bottle bill is going to go, is what happens if all of those materials get put in the bottle bill? What is going to be left in the curbside container at all? That's not really just trash. Or maybe our 120AA process just comes down to a one month, one day a month paper pickup. So anyway, something to consider. Thank you. I just want to I want to comment on that. One of the things that we suggested when we were speaking to our legislators and the powers to be in Albany was, okay, put the wines and spirits glass in the bottle bill and make it 25 cents. Because, I mean, uh, that's not a lot of money to put on a bottle of wines and spirits that's anywhere from six to $6,000. And, you know, so that would account for that point. And if you did the 25 cents on the wines and spirits, if you look at the amount of glass that was going to be, and the further rec unreclaimed funds, that could be a great revenue. But what about, not like, what 13 cents would be the equivalent today of five cents back then? So what's, what's even inhibiting changing it to 10 cents for the, for the other model? I, I think you're right, but I don't think it's been considered. I think it's just a political consideration, okay? To what extent is there a, a, a positive or negative impact to the politicians who support moving it to 10 or 15 or 25. From a recovery standpoint, sure. I think a, you know, the dime, the quarter, is going to you know, energize and catalyze the recovery of, of more materials. But, but how do they decide? It's just politics, I think. That's my two cents. Uh, I guess I figured out what you must have asked by that response. So let me uh, say there has been um, a couple states are at 10 percent. Michigan's at 10. Oregon just went to 10. Um, their recovery rates are higher. Um, some of the uh, question about um, recovery rate going up to that recovery rate going up to the 90 percent um, or so that they've received um, because of going up to 10 percent uh, or 10 cents. Some of the question is how much of it is fraud um, uh, coming in from other states or whatever or surrounding areas, um, but. I will say we have a lot of that struggle in New York, especially in the downstate area. We have an awful lot of fraud from uh, New Jersey coming over, those kinds of things. Um, some of the debate or discussion I know that has occurred when it has been discussed whether we should raise it is that concept of fraud and uh, the concern that there would be um, a, a greater influx from now other states who or surrounding states who do have the five cents, but now we have ten. So. Do we get more there when we are experiencing a significant, I mean significant, we're talking lots and lots of money um, for fraud. And so I know there's some other discussions other than just the, uh, the uh, concerns that Andrew expressed. I guess a comment on, excuse me, a comment on that if you, if, you, if you increase the nickel to a dime on glass, great, you're gonna convert more glass. If you increase it on PET bottles or aluminum cans, you're going to have the same effect as expanding the bottle. 
In other words, diverting more of those plastic and metal containers from curbside. And so to the extent that you agree with the argument that you want to keep that as a curbside program, that has the same negative effect of basically diverting more material. And so if actually if you look at states, we're trying to get this information now, if you look at states with very high aggressive bottle bill, they do get a higher redemption rate, absolutely. Put a quarter on it, you're gonna get higher. But basically what's left is the, the Merck material. And in New York City, if you have an all plastic program, if you've gone to one or two bottles, fine, it's not gonna affect you. But if you have all rigid plastics, in New York, we take all of this thermoform PET. The therm remaining thermoform PET, if you strip the bottles out, is garbage. Basically, we can mix this at up to 10% into our PET bales. If you look at, you try, I've heard presentations that in California, thermoform PET is garbage because they take all the bottles out and they get a CRV redemption value. So from our sort of perspective in New York and City, at least trying to basically have it as inclusive a recycling program as possible, allow as much plastic in there as possible, you start to jeopardize some of these non-bottle plastic recovery programs. Yeah, this question is more directed towards uh, Paul, right? Um, I don't know if you can comment on what's happening. You mentioned UK and Ireland, actually. And I was just wondering, um, is there any lessons learned from over the pond? Actually, I'm originally from Ireland, so I can't tell by my accent now, but I'm having this crazy dilemma in my head, how to drink Guinness. You know, Guinness comes in a keg, but it's best served in a glass, right? So I think glass is never gonna go, it's been around for 3,000 years, it's well vetted, we're gonna have glass. But um, I'm just wondering how, if there's any lessons learned or best practices and how that's impacted your business over there versus over here. And if you've seen any change in your, um, you know, uh, materials coming into your plants here already with the glass prices happening. Sure, so on the, on the question of, let, let's talk about the European Union generally. Yeah. So dramatically different world um, in the 90s largely driven by climate considerations. They said, um, we want to decrease our land <coughs> hard to decrease the methane generation. We want to increase our recycling. They put in place the landfill directive for the European Union and the recycling directive. Those things get implemented by the member states how they see fit. You know, in some cases, large landfill taxes on biodegradable materials and the like. Uh, and it's had a dramatic change. Uh, Germany recycles the same amount we landfill, over 60% of their waste stream. They do energy recovery on balance um, and landfill less than a percent. Uh, the Dub Dublin plant we just constructed as part of Ireland's effort to sort of comply with those directives. They've been linked to the table, same in the UK. So they are building their recycling programs as they speak. But, um, you know, the, the <coughs> ethic is different. The educating effort is different. The financial incentives are different. They've done it all. And the results are pretty dramatic. Is there one thing that you would say we should do here based on the experience there or knowledge there? Well, um, because uh, theirs is a top-down driven policy, and that's not how we do it in the U.S. We're bottom up, right? Local communities, state to some degree. Um, it's very hard to think that we're gonna have in place comprehensive policies to really drive the process. But we also like in the U.S. market-based solutions. An EPR, product stewardship, is a market-based solution. Take a few minutes, folks, to read the the double-sided two-pager, and that's what Germany has, and that's how Germany and the rest of the European Union and some of the provinces in Canada are, re are, are achieving significantly higher recycling rates than we currently have in the United States. One more. Andrew, I really Save like the best for last. Go for it. I really like what I heard. EPR. Yeah. Rather than supply chasing demand, demand will will drive up the supply, <coughs> and uh, you know, I'm a member, of, we're a member of the APR, which is the Association of Plastic Recyclers, 
most of us are very small companies. We're not multi-billion dollar corporations uh, scattered all over the country. We collect the bottles, we, you know, we process them. Um, but do you think that brand owners want to hear from us? Do you think the brand owners really want to use recycle? What about, what about the resin? We're just a pain in their ass. So if, if there's a law that forces uh, content in producers' material, that will drive demand. And Engelbright's bill does drive content, an example. And we are hearing increasingly, which is encouraging, uh, from producers that they want to use more recycled content in their products and their product packaging. So to do that, they're going to need some other system well, as part of yes, the supply chain. Because yes, we have a disconnect in the supply chain right now. That's a big deal right now. And they've been, they've been, they've been promising that for years. Yeah. Um, and actually, the use in, of content in soda and beverage bottles has gone down since virgin resin has gone. So it, the virgin resin price drives recycled price. So if there is a forced demand for material, that will that will move the whole uh, system. So if I understand this correctly, <coughs> the, the manufacturers of the bottles are resisting using recycled material. They always have. And so yeah. we we upstand the chance. <coughs> It's a, it, come on, Chris. It's <laughs> really? Why about it? Why do you think that 75% of the last 30 years we've been losing money? It's, it's like, Chris, it's like that line, impossible odds, certain death, what are we waiting for, right? So, but, but, it's, but the, the current situation is not acceptable either. I mean, do we want more of this? I mean, I, I, I think we've had enough. Paul, going back to the European Union for a moment, would you agree that their advancement, how far advanced they are in comparison to the United States, besides their moral desire and ethical desire to do it better, also came about on the fact that they had incredibly high disposal costs and lack of landfilling space in the 90s that forced the issue? It was about lack of disposal and the cost of it, looking for cost avoidance and thereby processing, recycling, waste to energy and all those factors came in as cost avoidance, would you, would you agree with that argument? Yeah, that exists. Their biggest policy instrument really was a landfill tax on, on biodegradable materials. And that, that outstripped even limited uh, landfill capacity. Uh, so that was a, a huge driving force to, to increase recycling and, and grow energy recovery as well. Okay. You, you know, uh, my thing was reality. Right, so, so this is all part of that discussion, and I want to address Dave on, on the glass, but understand this, and Michael will attest, 89, I was hosted by the venue on their private jet for a week in France. Okay, to consult I was like behind, but... Yeah. I, you were like behind, I went. Okay? So now 89, I, again, I was three, right? 89. Their, their waste generation, their complement of waste, what's in their waste stream, drastically different. What's in California's waste stream drastically different. What's in New York's waste drastically different. Part of the statistics, and, and is Pratt still, Cohen still here? Miles? You can take statistics and manipulate them for whatever you want them to show. Absolutely. Okay? China's shipping out of the West Coast because those boats are a whole lot easier to float to China than to get a New York container over to China. Okay, we're still shipping the China paper. No one else in the East Coast gets. Okay, there's a whole lot of compliments, but we're also a whole lot different. And there's not any one form that fixes the whole problem. We have to do it regionally. Don't worry about Europe. They have a different waste stream. We have to look at our waste stream. We have to solve it locally. So then I'm going to go to this issue. Dave, I am not in any way, shape, or form willing to give up recycling glass. I've been trying to do it for 32 years. I'm not giving up now, okay? I'm not giving up now, but I want it limited. I want other substitutions there that can be more readily recyclable, right? I want the state to mandate glass in asphalt in other uses 
that create a demand. Okay? <coughs> However, 120 AA, okay? We can fight his lawyers all day long. I'll take that case pro bono. Okay? <laughs> the problem is, I don't acknowledge it. Don't, I'm going to advise you not to answer it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Let's take this subject that the last round. Okay. We're talking about what we're going to do. Okay. okay. Right now, thank you. Thank you, Scoop.